Badu Jag hit me so hard, I forgot what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I immediately turned into like want to fight, like because because he hurt me. And then I, from that point, he hit me again, and I started thinking about stupid stuff, like <laughs> I got to pick up milk from the store type stuff, like. It, you, you get you get hit so hard that you lose what your focus is, <laughs> you know. You know what? One thing for me that I love to do is I look at I like to look at outliers. You know, people that stand out in their field and they're like I said, you're the man in strength and condition, especially in the boxing. Thank industry. you, sir. It's just thank off. you. Thank and, you. I, um, I like to look at people that are standing out in the industry and what makes them different, right? And one thing I truly believe is, especially at the age now, just something I'm just really obsessed with, is that it's never just a one-hit wonder because a lot of people will think, you know, uh, Larry Way just turned up and he was with Sean Porter and then he blew up on the scene. When I looked through, when I looked through your, I was looking through Wikipedia the other day, right? <laughs> this is why I contacted you. No, but listen, this is why I contacted you because I was looking through Wikipedia the other day. And I swear to God, I got to maybe uh, halfway through the page. I was like, what? Am I looking at the right guy? And I go back up and I'm like, <laughs> you've achieved so much in track and field. There's so many yeah. things you've done so far. Yeah. Just um, and not a lot of people know that about you. But you know, th that that is the blessing, is that um, I've experienced a lot of life. So I've seen a lot of ups and downs. And I've been able to live through the positives and the neg negatives of learning through mistakes because mistakes happen as well. So the older you get, the more wisdom you get. So yeah, I've, I've been in the sports for a long time. I've trained over 50 championship medals and in international championship medals in the sport of track and field. I've trained NFL guys who've been to the Super Bowl, NBA guys, major league baseball guys, pro uh, boxing now, winning the titles I've run with them. And now bobsled medals as well, just as of recently. So I've trained a lot of guys and a lot of young ladies. And so I don't always speak about it, but that is the blessing of being in my position because not only have I coached other individuals to do things at a very high level in their sport, being a former elite athlete myself, I bring a certain mentality that I know is, has to be understood. And to be great, only the ones who are able to receive and understand that understanding of that knowledge are the ones who actually exceed and go to where they need to go. Because being great is not a, a rationally thought process. People think you cannot rationalize yourself to the top. You're gonna have to have something special, a certain level of quote unquote insanity uh, to go through all the trials you have to go through and still believe you're supposed to be on top, right? And so I understand that concept from not only a coach's standpoint, but an athlete's standpoint, and they've received me well. So I just bring the knowledge I have with the experience I have, and I learn from each boxer individually, which allows me to be able to pull out the best in them. I was gonna, when you, that's what I was gonna ask you as well, and it's something you kind of asked it already, is just being a strength and conditioning coach is, you know, you're great at that, that's obvious because you get the results. But yes, the reason it's, it seems like, Boxing is such a mental sport, and I'm sure every sport is a mental sport because, especially yeah. when you're at the elite level, it's it's hard right. to argue that it's not. But that must be a something that you need in your game too, especially at elite level, just to be there as a mental coach as well. Right. I, I believe that's what truly separates me from other strength and conditioning coaches is the fact that my mentality has always been about greatness and not accepting anything less than. And so when I come into a camp. No one looks at me as a guy who's going to accept mediocre performances. No one looks at me as a guy who's going to be, okay, it's just okay today. You did just okay. No, I'm going to maximize each and every day, and that's expected. Greatness is always expected. I say that every opportunity I get because that's the model I live by. And greatness is a lifestyle. It's not a matter of you just wake up on Tuesday and be great. No, you have to chase greatness Monday through Monday every day of the week. And that's how you earn the levels of respect and the levels of greatness that you want to achieve. It's not going to be a part-time experience. It's going to be a full-time life. Let me ask you a question, just as a, from experience myself. Since I was a kid, I was always in the gym. I was always doing something, right? And then you can get in, there's two mindsets. There's a the mindset of the guys that are naturally talented and sometimes they don't want to be there, or the guys right. that are talented, they want to be there. And there's a guy that ain't talented, but he just works his ass off. Right. But my question for you is this, right? The guys that 
don't want to be there. You know the guys that when they turn up, maybe they're like, yeah, you know what, today I don't want it. Or, no, I think a better one would be the guy that wants to work his ass off, but work, working your ass off every day, especially when it comes to strength and conditioning, and you would know better than this than me. Right. Maybe I'm wrong. But every day working your ass off ain't necessarily a good thing. How do you manage that? Well, here's the thing. When, I, when I'm speaking Monday through Monday, uh, it's, it's, it's a very real thing. It doesn't mean physically that you're mm -hmm. going to be active Monday through Monday. What it means is, you can't perform in the boxing gym or anywhere Monday through Friday, drink, party, Saturday and Sunday, and think you'll come back Monday and do that for a period of two to three months and be successful in your performance. You're not going to. So the Monday through Monday is physical activity, it's rest, it's mental focus, it's also mental rest. You know, this, all of that is part of the developmental process. And in order to do that, you have to be willing to first understand you got to work for it and sacrifice. That's going to be the key one. You got to be willing to sacrifice. You got to be willing to give some things up in order to be great at what you do, whether it's hang out with your friends, uh, drinking, partying. Uh, what I see more often than anything with the type of athletes I have is um, holidays, having to sacrifice those to get ready for your fight. I've known two Christmases in a row. I missed it personally because I was at a fight with say Badu Jack or whomever else. And I wasn't with my family on Christmas. So these are the type of sacrifices that you have to give, not only as a coach, but you have to give those up as an athlete, if you're ever going to be great. So uh, when I say Monday through Monday, I'm referring more to the, the concept of what it takes to be successful mentally and physically. Success, success is a mindset, isn't it? It's it is. It's definitely. Cool where did that start for you? When did you feel like you had that mindset for success? Has that always been there? Was it, do you think you're born with that? Was that something you learned? You know what, mom? It's funny you ask that because I talked to my mother today and, and I didn't have any intent on talking to her about this. She says to me, do you remember when you were five or six and we went to a competition and you lost and you came up in the stands really upset and acting out and I had to threaten to whoop you because you wouldn't stop. And I was like, yeah, I remember that. She said, even at an early age, you hated losing. And I said, you know what? I do remember that. But then I asked myself, why did I hate it so bad? I think it's because of my, my belief in who I am as a person that I don't ever want to put myself in a situation where I didn't give 100% to what I did and me come out in any other way other than successful. So I want to... So I, could, I knew at that particular age that I had just started running. I didn't know much, but I knew I shouldn't have lost. And I knew I had to go back and work harder. So I was upset about that. And that's kind of followed me my entire life from being an athlete to being even a coach in sport or track and field to getting introduced to the NFL to being able now to coach boxing at this level. Accepting losing is something that I'm not comfortable with. Losing to me is almost like a disease. If it's there, I need to take the I need to take something to get rid of that ASAP because I can't take it. <laughs> I gave not sleep at night, right? So that's how I look at it. I really do believe that I've been uncomfortable with anything less than the best. And so if I'm going to remain and try to be the best at what I do, I have to keep like-minded people around me. And if you look at the type of boxers that I work with, some may think they're crazy. Some may think they're the ultimate gentleman. Some may think they're just super, super talented. But one thing for sure is they all carry that competitive, I want to be the best mentality. And that's why I believe I've been able to stay in the sport at the level that I'm at the sport in and continue because that mindset is needed in, in order for you to be great. Interesting you say that now, you know, because I've been thinking about the same thing lately as well, because I've got a seven-year-old son. And when I play with my son, I never, let, I let him win sometimes, but I let him know that the real world doesn't let you win. Yeah. That's the that's real life. In real life, yeah. no one lets you win. So um, when he loses, he gets upset too. Like, real upset. Starts crying. Right. And, stuff. Yeah. and uh, I stopped for a minute and I thought, lose it. not liking to lose is a good thing. I, I'm happy he doesn't like to lose. But I want him to be able to take a loss. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So I don't know how... How would you uh, how would you approach that? Say you're, you're, you're coaching a fire, world champion at the highest level, he loses his belt. Where do you go from the next time you see him? What, how would you, what's your approach in the next training camp with that? I've been there. I've been there. 
I think the first title I, I we where we lost and 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 right now. I uh, just had a fight last night with Rolando Romero. I think my winning percentage is like 90% now. At a, it's at a 90 percentile. And uh, when I lost my first fight, uh, it was with Sean Porter, actually. And we uh, lost Kel Brook. And that was a hard loss for Sean, right? Hard loss. And it was a hard loss for me in regards to that I don't like to lose. Immediately after that loss happened, I had I was already ready to get back. You know, I'm already ready. I'm, I'm not taking it. I'm going to get it back. I want that win, but I'm not the boxer. Sean Porter is. So I had to kind of chime into where he was mentally to be able to navigate, help navigate him out of that. Uh, him and Sh Kenny Porter and I, we kind of came to the conclusion that the, one of the best things to do is to get him back on the horse and get him back in the ring. And so we looked at those mistakes that we made in that fight you know, because I've never been in a fight where I've seen that somebody be able to clinch you that many times in a championship fight. I think we had like 88 holes before we got to like the ninth round, right? And so I had never experienced that. So we knew moving forward that that would be an issue where people would try to use that same concept, hold him to keep him from being explosive and doing the things he needs to do. So we immediately identified that as being a problem. We changed some things up. So we learned how to get out of those clinches the way we need to. And so the next fight, we got him in there. He actually fought Eric Bonet. And I think he knocked Eric Bonet out by the maybe fifth, sixth round. I'm not sure, but uh, that got us back on the horse. And, and the thing that's the greatest about that, it was almost as good as winning the title for the first time because it made me help to confirm what I've been saying to him the entire time, that you didn't lose anything. We made some mistakes that got the belt. Let's go back and get it again. You're still an amazing boxer. And I got a picture of me holding him as we're walking to the back because that's the sentiment of what I wanted him to understand is that in every championship champion's mind and life, they're going to take a loss, whether it's in the ring or outside the ring, they're going to take a loss. What helps determine you being great is your ability to bounce back from that loss. Floyd Mayweather is undefeated. He is probably one of the best boxers to ever touch the sport, if not the best boxer to touch the sport. But I'm pretty sure he's taken a few losses outside of the ring. I know for a fact he has. And, and those type of losses is what has helped mold him into not only being the boxer that he is, but being the man that he is. And as long as he continues to live and we continue to live, we're going to always go through our trials and up and down. It's about, it's about how you deal with it. Uh, and an interesting thing for me when I think about your role just in a in a team is when you're going in there, right? Have you ever had it where, like you said earlier, having a good team around you is the key. And yeah. I'm learning that now, just looking at, like I said, I like paying attention to outliers, man. And every single guy, they might seem like the individual, but they always got a great team around them. Correct. So when I'm thinking about you, right? Have you ever, a guy's come to you and said, listen, I know you do. You're great at what you do. I want you on my team. In training, like you said, you take losses. And a good, I don't know if you would agree with this, but a good idea of how they're going to take that loss, maybe in the gym. You might be able to see where they're at mentally in the gym. Yes. When they, I don't know, they can't, that last rep or that last 100, a one meter maybe, it's too hard, but they quit or they fall down and they don't get, get up. <laughs> Have you ever had their moments where you're like, oh, this, this guy ain't got that mentality. He's got the skills, maybe he's got the talent, but he ain't got the mentality, man. Have you ever had I a moment? I have had that happen uh, once or twice. And uh, because I take what I do so seriously, I don't play games when it comes to those moments. Because besides the fact that I put my name and my reputation on the line every time a guy gets in a ring, and I mean every time he gets in a ring, what's more important to me than that is the guy's life or woman's young lady's life that they're putting in on the line every time they get in there. So I, I don't play games when it comes to me watching you give up or quit based on the adversity because most boxers get hurt for one or two reasons. Usually it's either they did a very bad weight cut and they're dehydrated to some point, the water's not on the brain the way it needs to, they get touched and it causes internal bleeding or they get fatigued, make mistakes, and they get caught. 
And when they get caught, that's when the injuries come around, the mental injuries, if not their life. Uh, I don't remember how many people died last year. I want to say eight or more last year in boxing or seven or more in the sport. But since I know there's a possibility that this young man or young woman may not walk out of that ring, I don't ever want to hold on to responsibility of you not walking out because I didn't do my job the way I was supposed to. So I had a guy who uh, will kind of quit on a run mentally on me. And uh, I'm not going to lie, I blew up. I blew up. I blew up. I was like, I don't play games. I take this shit seriously. If you can't do this and you need to get the, out the sport, you need to get out the ring because I'm not going to live with the responsibility. Of you not getting back to your kids. I'm not going to do it. What am I going to do? Tell them I saw it in training and I didn't do anything about it. Not just let it happen. No, I'm not going to do that. You're going to do this 100% physically, and mentally, the way I'm asking you to, or we're not going to happen. There are a lot of other guys who want to work with you. I don't have to be that person because if you're going to be with me, I need 100% because I know for a fact I cannot live with the fact that I saw the mistakes, I saw the characteristic issues, and I didn't address it and I let it go by because I can promise you this, it's going to show up. It always shows up when the heat's on. It always shows up in the middle of the midst of the battle who's going to let go first. I can promise you anyone you've ever seen me work with they have never given up in a fight. They have never not thrown punches even through whatever. They're going to dog it through every athlete I train because it's a mentality. It's not just about a workout. Listen, understand it. I did an uh, interview about Caleb Plant not too long ago. We were doing some stuff on the track, and it was shown on Fox PPC. And I said, no matter what, he knows no matter how he feels, he can let his hands go. Because all I think about is that moment when it's time to exchange – Who's going to put it first? It ain't going to be us. It's going to be you. That's, see, that just show. just hearing that is the value. I feel like I can go out now and do something myself, but that's what I'm saying. Just <laughs> hearing that. No, but that's how value, do you understand what I'm saying? Just that yeah, mentality, yeah. bringing that in your, in your team and just having right. that around you. You would have to have that mentality to do what you do, right? You know, you having that, because if you gave any, if you gave a, you know, if you gave a, a step, They'll take a mile. You you got because it's such. No one wants to do strength and conditioning. No one wants to do it. It's tough. Yeah, yeah. it's real it's real tough. So you couldn't, you can't be a soft touch and do that rock. I just can't imagine it. Well, look at it like this. This is how I always describe it. You got the zoo, right? Mm. And you got people who feed the animals in the zoo. You got the people who feed the pelicans, the penguins, you know, the other animals, and then you got the lions and the bears. The person that's feeding the lions. It's a special breed of a man or woman, special breed. The one who's feeding the pelicans and, and penguins, that's easy. Just throwing that out there. Anybody can almost do that because you're not going to get approached much. But you feed a lion, they're going to come for you. They're going to growl at you and they're going to test you to see what you're about. The same way with boxers, you're dealing with people who have a very strong skill set from a boxing standpoint and a lot of times a different mentality. You better be strong enough to endure that. And you better be ready when they growl at you to stand strong and say, what? You ready? You want to try it? Okay, let's go to work. Because I ain't going to fold on you. And you know, and once they realize what kind of person you are, then they like, oh, I got a real one beside me so we can go to war. But they're going to test you. You got to be strong enough to stand up to the test. Right? And that's just being very honest. And, but the only time that that kind of changes is probably in the last week, if not week and a half of camp. Because that, by that part, you don't already help build this gladiator physically and mentally, and they're ready to take anybody's head off, including yours. So, <laughs> and plus they're starting to cut weight. So you gotta be able to let a couple <laughs> of things slide. You know, I've had a guy before, <laughs> and I ain't gonna say his name, where I was talking to him and I was like, hey, you know, this was our optional day in that period. You went, I said, hey man, what's up? You went, quit whispering at me. I said, I'm not whispering. And he said, you always whispering. And then he looked at me and when he said it, my immediate response was, hey man, but I had to think. He's cutting weight. He's in the last 10 days going into his fight. He's, he's chiming down. He's that edge that you're trying, that you see him coming at you with, 
that's what you want him to have. Don't try to break it. Don't, this ain't the time to stand and be like, what you want to do? This is the time where you say, okay, the work's been done. Hey, listen, I'm just want to know if you want to, if this time is going to work for you today. All right. If not, we'll do it another time. And that's how you have to know how to manage. But prior to that moment, nine times out of 10, I'm standing strong in the sand because I need him to understand how important this stuff is. I don't ever want a guy to question himself when he goes in the ring. I don't want him to be like, oh, I want to throw punches because I don't be tired. No, throw as many as you want. Man, it, it just shows how many layers there are to it and how important it is. It is. It's very important. You got to have a strong team. You know, you really do that. That statement, you're strong as your weakest link is true. Uh, one thing I want to ask you was just because I, I just want to know, I'm so curious in, you know, how this works and how the cogs work. But um, heart rate, do you, do you work, do you pay attention a lot to heart rate and or what if a really basic time. version of it? All the time. So what, what kind of things do you look for? Well, I'll, I'll tell you like this. When I'm testing a guy, before I even work with a guy, I do an evaluation on him the same way you would with a doctor. And this is what I don't know about why, why most trainers don't do this. They'll get a guy and just immediately start training. Guy. Well, you don't even know, just like a car, you don't know how, what the machine is like. The body might look good, but the motor might not be any good, right? So unlike a car, you can add, you can hook up your diagnostic to it and it's going to give you the numbers and you're going to know everything you need to know. That's, that's kind of the same way I do when I'm training my guys. I, I'll give them a little stress test like you would in the, in the doctor's office. Check your heart rate under different scenarios from training to different energy systems. I attack each energy system and kind of just see where your heart rate is in comparison. Once you get that, then I got a good idea what your genetic disposition may be from an anaerobic, aerobic position. And then I also get your blood work and stuff done because you can have this great car and this great motor, but then you got horrible oil or gas in the engine, right? I had a situation when I bought a luxury car like 20 years ago. I think I bought a Jaguar like 20 years ago. And when I got it, I was so excited. I went to gas station, put some gas in it. I'm riding down the street. And then the next day I'm driving and it kind of like sputtering. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is a brand new car. What's the problem? And uh, I took it back to Jag and they told me, we don't see a problem with the car. We looked it up. I said, no, nah, something's wrong. So I got back in the car and I drove down the street and it started sputtering again. I took it back, got the mechanic. He rolled with me. He felt it and he's like, oh, we didn't ever get that when we hooked it up. And he, he went through, he hooked it up, did the whole diagnostic again, couldn't find it again. And then he asked me, Mr. Wade, did you, what kind of gas did you put in this? And I realized I had put regular 87 gas in it. That car is not built to run off of 87, right? So the point I'm making is I learned then in something that had nothing at all to do with sports that if, you can have this great machine, beautiful outside, great motor, but if the inside isn't working correctly, you're not gonna get a, a great performance. So you have to be able to understand what the blood work's looking like and what may need to be adjusted. You have to know what energy system you're dealing with. You have to know what uh, body type you're dealing with from an ectomorph, endomorph, you know, type mesomorph situation. You gotta know what you have in front of you to have a better understanding as to how to create a workout for that person. Every workout I have is tailor-made for each person. That's awesome, man. I always think about stuff like that, like uh, trying to think of examples. But you've got a fast twitch muscle muscle guy. You've got a slow twitch muscle guy. Most people in boxing, what would you say they are mostly in boxing? Would they be slow twitch? No, nah, man, they're all, they're all mixed up. They're See, all different. That's fun for you then. <laughs> it's all different. You have to be able, so for example, you know, you, you get a guy like Sean Porter, right? Well, Sean Porter isn't built like a bottom jack. And so genetically, you have to understand what you're looking at and then train the per person accordingly to the body type. And there's also boxing years and training years. You know, you get a guy like Sean, Sean started training when he was four, right? So he'll have like 28 years of sports under his belt in the sport. Then you get a guy like Badu who started training, fighting with like 17. So he'll have like 20 to 19 years under his belt, you know? So you got you got training years, so there's different physical development as well that you have to play on, because maybe Caleb could do something here, but Sean can't do something here, or maybe Sean could do something here, that Caleb can't do something here, or the other way with Badu, you have to train according to the person. When I started with Caleb, he was a little lower here in his development, Sean's a little bit more here, now Caleb is here, you know, and he's performing at a very high level. 
I always wonder about that, you know. Like my little boy, he loves it. He's very active, very active. We play games like uh, we're roller dice and uh, you got, you times it by 10 and you've got to do that many push-ups or that many squats. But I always wonder, because he's young, there's that myth that if you work out when you're young, it stunts your growth. I don't know if that's mm. the same thing over in the States. Is that yes, something it you is. hear over there as well? Yeah, so I hear it all the time. Maybe it's too much for him. Is it, well, from a young, is it good for you or bad for you working out from a young age? Well, I, I'm a firm believer in not really getting a guy on weights until he's a, a, a guy or girl and waits until they're a teenager. Uh, mm. I don't try to put them at any late earlier because the reality of it is, you know, lifting weights can shorten the muscle fiber. So uh, you have to be very careful. I even watch myself with my boxers when doing certain workouts. So when I'm doing certain things, like you ain't gonna see a whole bunch of bench press stuff happening because it'll short, make the pectoral grow and shorten your, your punch. So you have to be able to understand how that works for the sport. Now, if you do it in football, you're great because most of your movements are here. But when you're in, when you're in boxing, most of the movements at an angle, throwing the punch off at an angle. So you got to have elasticity and mobility in those areas to be able to get that punch off at the level you want it done at. Is there certain things like the shoulders? You get a lot, lot of in, in injuries on the shoulders in boxing. Totally. Are you aware of stuff like that as well? Totally, totally. We, we definitely get a lot of injuries in those areas. Uh, I'm a guy who likes to be extremely great at what he does. So in those areas of rehab and things of that nature, I have a, a good understanding, but I brought people in that can help me in those areas. Uh, I got a guy named Paul Longworth, who you'll see uh, on a lot of my stuff. Paul is one of my uh, assistants in what I do. And, but also Paul is a, a certified uh, physical trainer in regards to health and recovery. So he got, he got his master's done at the University of Las Vegas, Nevada. I brought him in about two years ago. You'll see him on a lot of different videos with me. And Paul, is his, his main job is to make sure that my guys stay healthy. If there's any problem, knees, joint, back, Paul's when I bring in to make sure those things are adjusted. My, um, my cousins used to do run a lot of track, a lot of track. Mm -hmm. And uh, their uncles actually live for Christie. And I remember okay. my, dad, my dad said to me, um, one thing Linford said was that stretching, when he started stretching, his game improved so much. I don't know if that, is that something you pay attention to or do you believe in that? Stretching a lot, it helps the body work better. Well, once again, remember the, the rubber band concept I gave you? Yeah, yeah. Some people are already naturally flexible. So over stretching them will allow them not to have the pop they need, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's some people who are really, really tight that you need to stretch in order to get the pop they need. I'm going to assume that uh, with Lefford's case, he was a probably a little tighter. He looks like genetically he's built a little tighter. So that extra stretch probably did allow him to have more force and power in what he did. Oh, OK, OK. Um, so it's all, all individual. It, everything is individual. And if anybody else, and I'm going to say this publicly, if you talk to a trainer, a strength conditioning coach especially, if they trail tell you they can train all their athletes the same, they're going to have very, very limited success. It's not going to last long if one of those what you call flash in the pan situations. You can't. You're going to have to train them all differently according to who they are and their genetic makeup and their uh, athletic development history. You have to do all of those. It's, a, it's not a straight formula. I can give you a cookie cutter workout. does not mean that it will work for you. It has to be tailored. Now, it's gen in a general sense, you can get fitter, get a little stronger, but to be the best at what you do, it's gonna have to be tailor-made. Like, just like a suit. You can go buy a suit at Macy's or JC Penney's or Dillard's or wherever, any store, Nordstrom. But when you get a tailor-made suit, you know when you step out, <laughs> you look good. I know there's a lot of people going to be calling you after that, but you sure? <laughs> the thing is, see, when you listen to somebody and they you they light up when they talk about something. Right. That, that's what I'm talking about. That's why I like speaking to people like you. And even, I remember speaking to Stitch Duran. And Stitch Duran's just like, just like you. In his field, he's right. the guy. When you talk about Me and cup, man. Stitch and I have done camps together now. I was waiting for that moment. We did our first camp together for the KSI fight, Logan Paul fight. That's the first oh, camp we worked together. And I was excited because I wanted to see if Stitch was everything they claimed Stitch to be. Stitch is amazing, man. Stitch is an yeah. amazing guy. Um, I was honored to be there with him. Stitch even put on my Coach Larry Wade shirt. It was like, look at me, Coach. 
I'm like, oh, you're you're cool. You're a fan of me too. We fans of each other. <laughs> <laughs> so that was great. But it's the same thing, just like when you were talking about fine tuning it, and I can feel it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the same thing when I was speaking to Stitch and he was talking about being a cop man. He lights up. Yeah, yeah. It's, if, what? If, you, if you love what you do, it's, it's no choice. Yeah, you can't not love it. What I, kind said of on that, I did on that interview with Caleb, on that same interview they just asked me about, and they said, uh, I said, Caleb was the only person to threaten to fire me if I took it easy on him. And then I said, <laughs> but I ain't worried about that because I love my job. And that's true. I love what I do. So you don't ever have to worry about me not giving 100% because it's not just your name on the line, my name on the line too. And I want you to look amazing. So when you look good, I look good. That must have been nice to hear though. Cause now you know you got the right guy. You're with the right guy. If he's saying, hey, you know, if you take it on easy on me, that's what you want, right? That's what you want to hear. He's the only person to ever tell me that. Really? Yeah, he's the only person to ever tell me that. Uh, the other guys, everybody, see Caleb is a, was one of the last edition of the guys in the recent uh, past five years that I brought on. And uh, he saw the work I did with a lot of the other guys but he always measured himself against the world, not just, you know, himself. So he's like, look, you train these other guys and I like that and they're good, you're good with them, but I want to be better than them. So if I find out you're taking it easy on me, I'm firing you because I got to be the best. And that's yeah. in his mentality. And all that will get me excited because I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> what you want to do? You know, it's almost like a challenge in a sense. Like, okay, I'll hit him with this hard today. Let me see if he, hit, he can deal with this tomorrow. He said, take it easy. I ain't going to take it easy. And I just elevate. And he was like, okay, bring it. And I elevate. And he'll go up. So he'll keep going back and forth. But that's why you see it every fight. He's gotten better every yeah. fight. You know, the Mike Lee fight, he says to me, Coach Wade, this kid's not gonna, I don't want him to last. How many sessions do I need to do in pre-camp? Not camp. Pre-camp. How many sessions do I need to do a week? I said, uh, let's try two. He said, okay, three it is. I said, two. He said, three. He not to do that. I think I don't know around the fourth, fifth round. That's what I was talking about. about earlier, though. The guys that just they want it so bad. Sometimes right. you can push it too far, so it's trying to rein rein you in a little bit. Right. So, but that, that's what you want to hear. I was watching um something on Bo Jackson. A lot of people in the UK won't know who that is, but uh, right, not right, Bo right. Jackson. Herschel Walker was the guy. I was looking at. That guy is a super athlete. Yeah, and when I was looking, works his ass oh, That's what I was getting at. So, what you talking about, Caleb? Um, is the same thing when I was watching his interviews and stuff like that. He didn't need nobody around him. He, on just on his own. He wanted it that bad. He wanted to work hard. He was at home doing whatever he needed to do. So right. when you hear someone like that, them guys, they always reach the top. Always. Right, right. So just, we we just been waiting, you know, in the sense where, you know, when I got Caleb, I think we was like, I don't know, 13 and 0 or something at that time. And um, we, we weren't at a title yet. We weren't close to a title. He's had that mentality from before he even got a title. You know, he he was pushing back then. And now that he understands, he still trusts me to develop him. Because even during COVID, he called me, he said, wait, Coach Wade, I'm ready to work. And I said, good, this is what I want to do. And he said, okay, this is what I want to do. And I said, all right, good. So we went on and put on some more power, some more strength. We had break. I'm grateful. Because a lot of times, guys try to put on power and strengthen at a time where they can't get the benefit from it, you know. You put on too much muscle too fast, you can't do the things you thought you could do. But if you give yourself time, you can start utilizing, uh, you know, the body, the muscle the way you need to. That's why for a long time, strength conditioning coaches were looked down upon because they would take these guys who call themselves strength conditioning coaches who came from maybe a football background or whatever, and will make these guys look amazing during camp. I mean, cuts and everything. Then fight started and they couldn't do anything with it. They were getting tired fast. But just like, and my, I always use this example, if you get a city that has 1 million people and then all of a sudden a new company moves there where they bring another 1.5 million to the city, now you got 2.5 million in the city that was created for 1 million people. The freeway is gonna be congested. You're gonna have a hard time getting around because the infrastructure doesn't support that many people being in the city. Well, here you are creating this muscle that has gotten so much bigger in a short period of time and you have to provide oxygen to the muscle, but you don't have the vessel infrastructure to support it. And now all the oxygen that was used up before with smaller muscle is being zapped out. <laughs> so 
by the larger muscle. So what you had conditioning for, let's say eight rounds, now you may got four. And you're like, dang, but he looks good. Strength conditioning doesn't work. No, it works. It just is done incorrectly. That's why pre-camp is important. That's why guys develop more when I'm able to have them multiple camps because I can't get more than 3%, if not seven max, I'm gonna say 3% of muscle mass every two to three camps. You know, you gotta get one here, one here, one here. So if I get a fighter in three camps and I can get 3% uh, muscle mass for three camps, that's over a year and a half where you put three, maybe 9% muscle mass. Now you can use that after a year and a half, two years. But if you try to do that same thing in a four month period of time, you're gonna have some problems. We started working with Caleb's power in June. We're in January, actually the beginning of February before his next fight. He can do it, he's ready. Well, what happens the opposite way? So say if you've got loads of muscle and then you uh, the person I'm thinking about is Anthony Joshua, not that he stripped loads of muscle, but you can see there's a different type of conditioning that he's in now. What's the effect on someone's body most of the time? Like you said, everyone's in an individual and everyone reacts different. But what's the normal result if you have lots of muscle and then you strip it down and then you're a lot more leaner? What's your performance like that? What, what's your performance? It, it depends on, per, on the person, but from a general sense, it's more speed. From a general sense, the lighter you are, the faster you are. You get a guy like Badu Jack. Badu Jack, when he went from 68 to 75, he brought a lot more speed with him, right? And then he fought his last fight, supposed to be 89, 90. And he brought a lot more power because he got bigger. But if I take him back down to 75, he's going to be faster. I take him back down to 68, he's going to be even fat, more fast than that. So usually faster hands, usually, and feet. He got a lot less mass to move around. I remember seeing a video that uh, you put up on Instagram. Now, my mind, I feel like my memory is going to betray me. But I'm sure you was talking about Buddy, Buddy Jack and you saying holding the pads or something and he was hitting you. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, man. Yeah. What happened yeah. there? Well, I've had it happen a couple of times, but Badu <laughs> is vicious with his body attack. Vicious. Oh. And uh, I had on the shield one day, and Badu Jack hit me so hard, I forgot what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I immediately turned into, like, want to fight, like, because he hurt me. And then I, from that point, he hit me again, and I started thinking about stupid stuff, like <laughs> I got to pick up milk from the store type stuff. Like, it, you, you, get, you get hit so hard that you lose what your focus is, <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah, that's, that, that has happened for sure. Oh, man. That one thing I would always wonder is, you know, performing, you being with these elite athletes, one thing I do wonder is how much of it is actual talent, you know, God-given athleticism, and how much of it is just muscle memory and hard work? What would your answer be that, from your experience? Uh, it's hard to answer that question because mm -hmm. I've seen guys not have a lot of talent and still get to the top through their worth ethic. Uh, then I've seen guys who have a lot of talent who's able to get right there to the cusp but can't pull it off because they don't have the work ethic. So I think it could be a combination of both. The best way is to be able to have both of them, talent with worth ethic. And those guys are guys like Floyd Mayweather, whose worth ethic is, is definitely undeniable along with his physical gifts. Floyd can do all sports from basketball to boxing. He could probably even play football if he wanted to. You know, but he has very athletic. So I think that guys who have both of those qualities are the ones who actually are able to get to the top and stay on the top. That's a beautiful thing about life in general. Just, you know, if you've got, to, there's no excuse. Not, no, there's no excuse, but you know what I mean? If you can work yeah. hard and you've got a work ethic, it doesn't matter if you're talented. It doesn't matter if you're six foot five, whatever it is. If you've got a work ethic, my true belief is you can do whatever you want if you put your mind to it. And nothing right. short term. That's what I was that's what I was talking about earlier. If you go way back to the start when I was talking about, I like looking at outliers and you're an outlier. And when I look at your history, it wasn't, it wasn't short term. I think you've just muted yourself, you know, by accident, maybe. Or if I muted you. No, I did it. I did it. it was, I, I did it because I got my, uh, my massage therapist outside waiting on me. So she just, oh, saw... they just hit me up. So oh, okay. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm almost finished with it. So that, so that's what that was for. I apologize. No, no, it's okay. 
Uh, I can't remember what I said now. But I, you know what? I don't want to keep you too long. I didn't plan to keep you this long. So uh, No, I'm but really it was great. It was great. I appreciate you reaching out to me. Uh, it was awesome, man. Pay to me on social media this week, though, because I'm going to be doing a lot. Because of COVID, I wasn't mm -hmm. able, I'm not able to go to Caleb's fight because oh, okay. uh, I'm outside the bubble now. And so uh, with that being said, I am still going to go to the fight. I'm just not going to be able to go inside the fight. So I'm going to go to the hotel and, and get there for the weight cuts and whatever I need to do to help with that. And uh, I'll be doing a lot many interviews in regards to the fight and moving forward. So I see I expect to get a lot of activity this week in regards to that. So if you're available and you can watch it, I would greatly appreciate it. But we're going to do a lot of work there in that regard. But I do appreciate your time as well. Thank you. And it's at Coach Larry Wade, isn't it? Your Instagram. Yes, it is. At, it's at Coach Larry Wade. And if you don't remember that, look up I Build Champions. If you pull up I Build Champions, my ugly mug will be on there. <laughs> uh, thank you, man. I, I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed this as well. Honestly, I could stay here forever. Yeah, I, I appreciate talk, you. I, I, I enjoyed the time. conversation too, and I actually uh, really you, enjoyed man. the type of questioning that you had. You know, sometimes I do them and it becomes so rhythmic, so yeah. same type of, and, and it gets boring. But whenever you can pull the passion out, as you saw in me, then I know it's a good interview. Thank you. That's a big compliment for me. So I really yeah. appreciate that. Hopefully, we could, I can contact you again, and, and maybe we'll have a little bit more time to talk sure. again, man. Sure. But I would love really to. enjoyed it. Honestly, I would so love. Thank to. you, man. No problem. Thank you. you. Have a blessed one. You too. God bless. I'll speak to you soon. Right, God bless. Take yes. care.